Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our December webinar. I am Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And today, we're going to talk about sustaining change, something that uh, healthcare professionals across the world are concerned about being able to do a little bit better and how to prevent your hard won efforts from failing. So um, we have a fabulous program today. We're going to be examining the current challenges and sustaining improvements that everybody shares. We're going to compare and contrast opportunities for education versus for communication and how you can leverage both of those to sustain your, your improvements. And then also we'll discuss how to set up the frontline workers for success so that they can help to sustain improvement initiatives. As always, we're gonna be providing continuing education credit from MedStar Health to nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. Respiratory therapists can also, in most cases, claim this credit. Um, and, and so if you, uh, if you are looking for this type of credit, please do be on the lookout for an email from MedStar Health uh, that you should receive this email within the next week. Um, you know, sometimes it does take five to seven days, but usually a little bit um, sooner than that. And as soon as you complete the evaluation, you'll receive that credit from MedStar. Healthcare executives are also eligible for this credit through the American College of Healthcare Executives. You can just log that into your portal um, on the ACHE website. Certified professionals in patient safety will receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and board certified patient advocates will also receive a, a certificate from us um, at, after this event. Um, again, please give us about, um, you know, at least a week to, to get that done. Um, and here you can see that none of the speakers and none of the, the planning committee has any conflicts to disclose. So uh, as always, we are welcome your, your comments and your questions. Please, if you have comments that you want to make, use the chat function. If you have specific questions that you'd like to ask, use the Q&A. We may or may not answer them as we're going through the program today, but we will save 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers uh, to discuss anything that we didn't get to. Sometimes we don't get to everything. so. Um, we will, anything that we don't get to today, we'll make sure that we answer electronically and we will post that along with this recording on YouTube. We're going to be using a product called Slido today uh, because we want your interaction. We want, we want to, to ask some questions and know what's going on in, um, you know, in your world. So please do uh, help us with this. Join Slido. You can do this on your phone. Just take your phone. Uh, you know, take a picture of that QR code, it'll take you right to Slido so that you can answer the question that's on the screen. Or you can go to slido.com and enter the number 464-125. We will repeat that, uh, those instructions again when we get to the first question. But for now, I am very excited to be able to introduce our moderator today. Uh, Chrissy Blackburn is our moderator today. She's the principal advisor for patient and family engagement at University Hospitals Health System in Cleveland, Ohio. She's also the mother of a child with complex care needs. So uh, she has uh, very, very much able to speak to both sides of this, of the, the healthcare coin here. So Chrissy, welcome. Thank, thank you so much for moderating this panel. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Donna. And thank you everyone who's joining us today. Um, it's always an honor to um, partner and work with Patient Safety Movement Foundation and all of their efforts um, to improve patient safety. Um, as Donna said, I'm Principal Advisor for Patient and Family Engagement at University Hospitals Health System. I've been in my role um, for about uh, almost eight years, but I've been in the role of patient advocacy work for 14 years um, as well. Um, mother to my daughter, Lily, uh, who successfully had her one-year transplant anniversary last Thursday. Um, so that's very exciting. So in my, um, in my role, I really, um, this work found me. I did not find it. Um, like most mothers that have children with medical complexities, we dive in and are really some of the best patient advocates that want to partner and work with healthcare teams. My position does sit within our Quality Institute. So um, am savvy around uh, quality improvement work, um, what needs to be done, and, and the difficulties of sustaining that work. 
Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists today, uh, Kristen Miller, who is the uh, Senior Scientific Director of MedStar Health, National Center for Human Factors in Healthcare, also the Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine, and affiliate faculty Georgetown Medical Center Innovation Center with Biomedical Informatics. Wow, Kristen, that is a mouthful. Um, and I would like to pass it on to her uh, to tell a little bit about herself, and I'll then introduce the rest of the panelists. Great, thank you, Chrissy. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so my role is scientific director at the Human Factor Center at MedStar, primarily focused on research. Uh, my own research portfolio, which is health IT, decision making, public health, uh, health IT policy, but then responsible for our overarching research portfolio as a center. And so lots of exciting work happening across the spectrum of human factors, things like safety surveillance, built environment, data science, informatics, um, lots of exciting projects that I can speak to. Um, and then lots of teaching as well. So I teach in the Georgetown Executive Masters in Clinical Quality, uh, Safety and Leadership. And also uh, as part of ICBI, there's a Masters of Informatics and Data Science. And so really making sure sort of the, the next level leaders or current leaders understand this human factors engineering approach. And I think really relevant to this talk today about sustainability, which can be quite challenging. So excited to be here uh, and look forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. It's a true love of human experience, human factors and math all rolled into one. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Joyce Alumno, who is the president and CEO of Health Corps, also president of Health uh, Retirement and Tourism, also known as Heart Alliance of the Philippines. Uh, Joyce, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi, um, uh, good morning to all of you and good evening from the Philippines. It's uh, past midnight for us uh, here in the Far East, as they call it. And it's really an honor for me to be with this uh, really dynamic uh, ladies from the US. Thank you so much for the invitation. What I do here, um, Chrissy, uh, Kristen, and Christine is that uh, I am currently heading this organization called Health Core Academy. And what we do is that we try to educate our healthcare providers in order for them to comply with the international standards of accreditation like uh, JCI, the Joint Commission, Accreditation Canada, NADH, and so on and so forth. And for the last, um, I'd say, what, 15 years of my life, I've been trying to spearhead the globalization of healthcare in this part of the world. I've uh, headed the development of medical tourism uh, program in the Philippines, uh, also called Health and Wellness Tourism, and also um, the Retirement Tourism. Uh, right now, I'm also teaching uh, in foreign service and also uh, strategic marketing. So those are some of the things I do here in the Philippines, and happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Joyce. We're so glad to have you here. And last but definitely not least, I'd like to introduce Christine Lacerna who is the Regional Director of Infection Prevention and Control at the HEROES Program at Kaiser Permanente. So next slide, please. We're going to jump into our first uh, Slido question. Um, and just a reminder on how to do that is you can join at slido.com using the 464125 or you can use the QR code with your, um, your phone's uh, camera to join today. So our first question to everyone is what types of initiatives are you currently prioritizing in your organization? Uh, you may select all that apply and then please just take a couple minutes to run through and answer those questions. Thank you. So it looks like our top priorities are workplace safety and wellness related initiatives, which actually comes at no surprise um, during the COVID uh, pandemic right now. Um, also, in second place, we see specific clinical initiatives such as sepsis, falls, et cetera. Also, not a big surprise. I know that falls um, just on an international uh, rate is, is a very high priority due to some of those staffing related initiatives which came in fourth. Um, and I honestly am very happy to see that there's um, some prioritization there with patient and family engagement related activities and initiatives as well. Thank you so much for for sharing your answers. And I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna dive into the first panel question. 
So um, we'll, we'll go to Kristen first and really answering, why do our current approaches to sustainment fall short? Sure, yeah, I think, um, I think this is such a great topic and one that maybe we're hesitant to talk about because everyone's so excited about the actual work, right? All of these new interventions and new approaches. Uh, but I think we can all be honest here that this stuff is really hard. Implementation to start is really hard, whether it's some you know innovative app that we think is gonna improve decision-making or simple changes in workflow or getting someone to use a checklist, whatever it is, that implementation is hard. Scaling it can be really challenging. But I think sustaining any of these interventions is probably the hardest piece of this. Um, and I think that happens for a number of reasons. We maybe you're working on something that's you know a funded project, and so your focus is to get something deployed and evaluate it, and then you sort of walk away from whatever that project is, or you sit on a root cause analysis panel, you come up with lots of different solutions. Uh, and then you find out none of them were ever implemented. That might be a different webinar, not about sustainability, but about actual deployment of this stuff. So I think there are lots of competing priorities. Everyone would agree. There's lots of excitement when you first deploy something. Um, and then over time, you know, if it's not integrated into workflow, if you don't have buy-in from stakeholders, if you haven't thought about the technical components for sustainability, then the stuff just isn't going to last. And so i um, excited today for us to talk about some of the opportunities here, whether it's a robust evaluation that continues over time, whether it's discussions with the right stakeholders at the table to begin with, to make sure that what you're developing is going to have some longevity and not run into, you know, any sort of technical or socio-technical challenges. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk more a little later about the actual design of something coming from this human factors lens. To me, that's the most important part is you know, there's energy and there's excitement, but what's the actual thing that you're deploying and what's the likelihood that that's going to be sustained? So I think lots of challenges here that lead to this lack of sustainment and sort of across the board, lots of different things that we could talk about technically, um, culturally, socio-technically, right? Lots of different contributing factors. Kristen, thank you so much. Looks like we have um, Christine back, who is next on the question. Christine, were you able to join us via audio? Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. wonderful. So, Christine, we were just talking about um, why do our current approaches to sustainment fail? And I know you were going to start talking about the overburdenness of, of staff and health systems. Right. Well, first of all, I'm sorry for the technology uh, issues I'm having this morning. And I want to thank you, first of all, for having me today and um, for hosting this conversation, which is very important, always been important and um, had taken on um, a, a new challenge um, because of what's going on in the world. So, um, yeah, so I, I think the number one um, feedback we get from frontline managers and frontline staff when we introduce you know, another improvement idea or another initiative is that, well, here comes another one. And um, I think part of the, the reason why we get that response is because we bring in the frontline manager and the frontline staff quite late in the game. So um, I think I'm sure later on we will talk about how we will um, inspire and um, promote sustainability. And one of the very important elements is that bringing in those who are doing the work as part of the improvement project from the very beginning, from the design of it, all the way to the implementation of course, sustaining the work. In that way, they were brought into the whole idea from the very beginning. And we are listening to to the actual problems that they are experiencing because it's their work that we are improving. And, and that will help with um, decreasing the feeling of being overburdened or just being put upon. Thank you, Christine. And you know, just in my own um, personal efforts around patient family engagement and, and how we try to involve patients and families in our quality um, initiatives and process improvement, you know, it's sort of on the back end, just like you're talking about with, oh, oops, we forgot to include the, the nurse manager or the uh, associate nurse manager um, or even the staff and providers. Um, 
and a lot of what we try to do is look at how we can piggyback or jump on to the end of you know other initiatives that are, are going on so when we talk about falls risk you know falls is very tricky because there's so many different pathways and processes that we try to look at and how to help people prevent themselves from falling but self pride and ego happens with patients they think they can do it and you know they get up right. to the bathroom you know um, unfortunately that happens so when we talk about that overburden and thinking about how we include the other stakeholders are there different ways and, and Kristen please feel free to jump in here too that we can really hardwire piggybacking on to other initiatives that we're working on in a specific project um, so that we're not doing we're not doing the overburdening of the staff. Right, um, Chrissy, I'll, I'll start and I'm sure Kristen will, will jump in. Well, I can only think of our own efforts in, in my organization where we have really tried hard to engage the frontline from the very beginning. And um, what we kn know from the very start is to create kind of the conditions to allow that. And um, one of the things we've done is um, including the frontline leaders, um, both formal and informal, um, into this structure, um, which in our organization we're calling heroes. And um, they are part of the conversation. They're part of that group. Um, and they are the ones that are identifying the problems in their environment and escalating the issues up to their managers and then thinking of solutions. So, and, and, the, and the role of that bigger group is to not only listen to the problems that are being brought to them, but also making sure that they are coordinating, right? And prioritizing so that not three groups are working on the same problem, but bringing the three groups together and working on that one problem and then spreading it out. And I think that's what you're, you're, you're speaking to when, when you talked about um, coordinating the, the, the work of, of the front line. So that's one um, uh, key strategy that we've done is, you know, we created this clinical work groups that consist of frontline managers, nurses, physicians, and um, subject matter experts. And then they bring it up to the bigger group so that they can talk about the work that they're doing and also ask for resources and perhaps connect with others doing the same work. Oh, Christy, I think we lost your audio. Oh, I was on mute. Was there anything else to add? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think Christine hit, hit the main actionable item right away, right? Which is you're designing this for someone, right? And they need to be at the table. And I think as engineers, we're really guilty of that, of, of coming to the table and saying, here, I built this thing for you. Uh, and that person saying, well, that, but that's not what I wanted. <laughs> that's nothing to do with what the actual problem is. So I think having those stakeholders there. And then as we think about actionable solutions, I would say the second piece is making sure it's not just that stakeholder, but it's everyone else and who's going to be impacted down the line. So you're rolling out some new initiative for, I don't know, screening for palliative care or financial hardship or suicide risk or whatever it is, there's the people that are doing the screening, you get them on board, you get that part implemented and sustained, but who else is going to be impacted, right? Do you have enough resources to have that financial hardship conversation or to do the palliative care consult? And then who else is impacted? So the IT folks that are building the screening tool, what do we need to know from their perspective Maybe there's, you know, EHR changes that happen all the time that are going to impact this process down the road or, you know, a number of other parties, leadership and patients. And I think really this thoughtful approach at the very beginning to think about how you're going to design something so that it has that longevity. Um, and I think we're going to talk about what sustainability is too, because that's a really important part of this conversation. Am I doing something because we're at the peak of COVID and I need to improve screening and then we can sort of, you know, roll back the initiative a little bit, or am I doing something that I need to sustain forever? Um, and I think those considerations are really important to what sort of the end goal and the timeline of the implementation as we think about how robust we need to build the architecture around it to make sure that it's sustained. 
Yeah, and I really like how you said the um, moving from the doing for to doing with. And I know when we talk about patient family engagement, we say that all the time. You know, we're not doing to, we're not doing for, we're not doing with. But we need to include our providers and our staff into that same statement as well um, so that we are meeting the needs and we really are truly understanding the problem and not seeing just what the data is, but what are the actual operational steps um, and, and the barriers that they face too. Thank you so much. We're going to move on um, to the next panelist question, which is, Kristen, thank you. Um, Christine, what does effective sustainment look like? Yeah, so we, we, are, we had been thinking about sustainability um, for quite a long time, formally for the past three years. And what we found is that we talk about sustainability a lot, um, but it turns out that we think about it differently. So I think from the very beginning, we've started, you know, um, quality improvement. We've always expected sustainability to be part of the conversation, but we haven't really formalized what, what the definition means. Um, you know, we've shared words. Um, we think we have shared vision, but the truth is we have not explicitly defined what sustainability is. And then what we found is that in literature, that's the, that, that is exactly the problem. There is no standard definition of what sustainability is, especially in the context of quality or healthcare improvement. Um, and, and that's part of the problem. Now, some people think that, okay, that's fine because that allows for flexibility, but in the longer term, it makes it difficult to, to create kind of a evidence-based, you know, um, or an operational paradigm because you don't have a standard definition to look to, and it's hard to benchmark what you're doing against others because the other problem is it's not measurable. So given the lack of like formal definition, there are many definitions, but there's no one definition. It's very important from the very beginning when you're designing a project that you define what sustainability means. So at least your own group or your own organization has a very defined um, uh, uh, vision of what sustainability means for the project. So for us, for instance, I mean, it's a very simple definition, um, which means that we would like to maintain, you know, the improvement that we've made, the processes that made the improvement possible. And then we've set the criteria, what that's going to look like, you know, that we have set perhaps a, um, a group, perhaps we've defined like uh, an accountability structure and um, there are definitive roles for every single person in that structure. And then we have um, identified how we would measure the, the improvement, how we would monitor it and how can problems be escalated and what we would do if um, there's a drift, which we're gonna talk about later or there's like a degradation of the improvement. And um, yeah, so, so we've defined what sustainability is, we've defined what the, the structures are that would support it, and also the workflow around that um, is what we think sustainment would look like. And, and another thing too is that, and, and this one is still is a work in progress, is that sustainability for us um, does not mean that you're consistently meeting a target, for instance, whether it's CDF or CLABSI. Um, what it means is that you have a structure behind that that could address, right, when your, your performance in CAUTI or CDF or what have your flaws had, had, you know, degraded. What do you do? That, that, is, that to us is the definition of sustainment. Christine, thank you so much. And, and really hitting it right on the head that, you know, that definition of sustainability really can throw us um, as far as finding what that structure is and what that process is. And, you know, looking at, at the end of the day, we are all in healthcare because we want to help. We want to help people. And patients and families, um, as I like to say, and many of my other national colleagues, are one of the most underutilized resources in healthcare. And it's not that, um, you know, not every patient wants to be involved. I mean, when we look at things like patient activation measures and point of care and how a patient or family caregiver is owning the health um, for themselves or a loved one, um, it's really just tapping into those patients and really getting some of that 
qualitative um, and quantitative data um, on what it is that they need as well. Um, and really when it comes down to the patient experience, um, it's doing what you said that you were going to do um, and providing that input and that structure. And, and many on, on this call as far as the panels and our attendees know CMS has developed that three-tiered level of patient and family engagement at point of care, mm -hmm. policy and protocol, and, and governance levels. Um, because as patients and families, we have an expertise, whether it's our experiences that we carry with us um, through the healthcare system, or our professional backgrounds as well that can offer input in that co-design in the sustainment process. Um, and really with, and when we look at it for those outcomes and what the patients want, it's the consistency in care, it's the delivery of care, and at their own, um, meeting them where they are as far as being engaged and involved um, in that process. So we're gonna move on to another Slido that will um, talk to patient and family engagement. And what we really wanna know is how is your organization involving patients and family members? So one, our organization utilizes our patient and family advisory councils and quality initiatives. Our organization invites patient and family advisors to participate on specific QI and patient experience project teams and committees. Our organization needs further education on how to build and utilize PFACs or inviting patients and families in quality improvement work. Or your organization does not have PFACs or does not involve patient or family members in projects. So it looks like um, about 46% are involving their patient and family advisory councils and in quality initiatives. Um, and I just think off the, off the top of my head, you know, where are they in the process when you begin? Are they involved in the very beginning? Um, I can tell you just from some of my own experiences that the, um, the organization will roll out a project, then they'll take it to the PFAC for feedback and input, and they find that they're starting it square one again um, and redoing, you know, an entire brochure or um, something else within a process around QI. Um, so really involving them in the very, very beginning is, is critically important. Um, it also looks like about 31% do invite patient and family advisors to be part of their quality improvement teams and committees. I'm very happy to see that. And that about a quarter of you would like more information on how to build and utilize PFACs. Um, you know, this is uh, something that I have done for many, many years with many of my national colleagues. Um, and for those that do not involve um, PFACs or patient and family advisors, um, maybe rolling in where the barriers are to that. You know, why is that? Is it, a, is it cultural? Um, is it training? Is it onboarding? Is it resources, et cetera? So thank you so, so much for answering those questions. And we are going to head into our last question for the panel. So Kristen, we'll start with you. What are actionable interventions for effective sustainment? Sure, um, real quick, I wanna address the comment you just made, because I think about engaging patients and families, because I think where people miss the mark is uh, meaningful engagement. And I'm sure Chrissy, you can talk about this, of, or put a patient on that thing, right? Or make sure there's a patient involved. But but how are we actually engaging the patient? What's the expectation of them? Um, and this is something I'm obviously passionate about because I think it's the same with human factors. It's the same with health equity. It's the same with patient engagement where there's this like pixie dust sprinkle of, oh no, I had a patient at the table, but what were you asking them? And, and how did that actually improve the initiative um, and it, it's not an afterthought. Like you said, it's, it's designing with, right? It's at the very beginning. It's not bringing a brochure and saying, does this look good? Like I want your sign off, but meaningful collaboration, I think from the, from the beginning. Um, but that's not the question you asked me. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> what, um, effective sustainment, again, I'm going to focus on like going back to the beginning of the design, because I think that's the critical part that's going to lead to sustainability or not. Um, Donna, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the hierarchy of control slide, um, because I think as we were talking about this idea of designing for sustainment, I immediately thought about all of the work in the engineering field where we think about um, strength of action and, and this idea of hierarchy of controls. And when we do physical things, right, a, a new construction build, or I 
um, remove the hazard. There's some sort of foreseen function. We know that these are the most effective controls, um, but also that they're the most sustainable. Um, so Donna, if you go to the next slide, this is sort of the engineering world, but this has been moved into a healthcare um, framework. And, and um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this, um, lots of places where you can find this, but thinking about what we call weak actions, which really are just foundational. You need training and education, you need new policies, uh, but those things alone are not going to be effective and they're not going to be sustained either. Um, asking people to remember to do something, um, that human vigilance is always going to fail. And then you think about intermediate actions and stronger actions. Are we making software modifications? Um, is it not just a policy, but some deep simulation training that people are going to remember for a long time, um, introducing a new cognitive aid or a checklist, and then these really strong things. So again, the forcing functions, simplifying and completely changing processes, um, architectural changes, that these are really the most effective and the most sustainable, but I also recognize there's huge trade-offs where you can't just physically redesign everything with new construction. Uh, it's very expensive, it takes a long time, you need lots of buy-in, there's competing priorities. Um, but to really think about what your intervention is and where it falls on this. And then, sorry, one more slide, Donna, there's some work that our center has done led by Zach Hedinger and Terry Fairbanks um, a few years back where they actually mapped these different actions and then looked at sustainability over time and thinking about um, adverse events that had happened and solutions that were put in place and saw a lot of the same things that we had seen in in the literature but actually in practice so that these built environment um, improved processes the sustainability was higher there um, it structure the stuff that's really hard, I think, institutional change, cultural change. Um, are we thinking about the well-being of providers and not about production pressure? These are the things, if you're able to make that change, those are the things that are sustained. So um, all that to say, I think it, it starts in the beginning, right? the design of the intervention, um, the effectiveness and complexity of it is directly tied to the sustainability that you're going to see uh, in actual practice. Thank you, Kristen. Joyce, we'll move to you as far as commenting as well. So the question was, what are actionable interventions for effective sustainment? All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, Alba, I can, uh, of course, uh, give uh, a full lecture on uh, sustainability, but uh, for the sake of, uh, for the interest, in the interest of time, I can probably just share with you one slide um, uh, for us to easily remember as a takeaway uh, regarding sustainability and uh, we can um, easily remember it as a four letter word, which is a step. And um, that is uh, to um, always uh, monitor uh, the implementation of whatever programs and plans that uh, we have set in the beginning, because um, in the, que the question of sustainability is always how to um, make sure that we deliver uh, with consistency in the future, um, looking at always at the long term, how to, um, make sure or ensure that the entire team will really deliver from beginning until the end. And um, so what for me is most important is um, to have some um, tools or monitoring tools that we can easily remember every time. And um, I would uh, call it as a step. First is to always remember or uh, monitor the status of our uh, patient and uh, always a patient being at the center of our, uh, or the, the core of our services. And um, considering always um, the status of the patient with the, all the plan of care, the medications and the vital signs. And um, second is to make sure uh, that we are always taking care of our team members. So that's um, letter T to always um, make sure that our workers are not, um, uh, uh, overburdened and that uh, they have the right skills um, in delivering uh, proper service. Um, they're not stressed out, um, especially nowadays and uh, we are in the pandemic. Of course, we have to always consider their mental health uh, and their safety. Um, the other thing that we should consider in order for us to uh, make sure that uh, we can sustain uh, the programs and uh, the plans that we had set is that uh, we should always uh, monitor and uh, look at the status of our environment. So when we talk about um, 
environment, this involves the facilities, um, the administrative information, of course, our staffing, um, our triaging, our equipment, our inventory, and so on and so forth. And the last one will be um, uh, the letter P, or which stands for progress uh, toward goal. Uh, we have to make sure that we monitor how we are um, uh, progressing in terms of um, the achievement of our goal, um, uh, the status of our team's um, patients, the goals that we have established as a team, um, what are the tasks or the actions that we had set and uh, if we are really um, able to uh, fulfill them and uh, always to check whether the plan or the program that we had set in the beginning is still appropriate. So I think um, these are some of the tools that I can um, um, uh, impart to everyone uh, when they do um, or um, uh, try to sustain uh, a program or a project for that matter. Thank you so much, Joyce. And um, to Christine, how do you identify when an initiative begins to slip and why does slipping happen and, and how do you correct it and prevent it? Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say to just listening to Joyce, um, I think she gave us kind of the sustainability and action at, at the frontline level, you know, with her staff. And then um, with Kristen too, she just gave us like the rundown of sustainability elements, like in the cliff notes. I don't know if people still know what cliff notes are, but I felt like that's what she, <laughs> she had given us. So yeah, so, so drift or degradation. So obviously we're obsessed with data, right? I mean, pretty much after the project has been implemented, what we do is we look at data constantly. We watch that dot every day. And every time it goes down or goes a direction we don't want, we, we literally like throw everything in it and start doing action planning, outreaching. I mean, that is our trigger. We are triggered by the dot. Um, so I, I said earlier that the most important piece of uh, sustainability approach or framework is that being able to monitor the data. Um, but the other piece to that is knowing what to do when the data shows you something. And, and the number one thing is not to panic, right? Not to throw everything and, oh, let's start a project because, you know, our CDEF had gone up like last month. So being very clear about what the triggers would be to trigger an action and what the actions would be. And um, I have said in the beginning that sustainability does not mean perfection. Does that that's that doesn't mean that you will achieve your target all the time, that it will always be zero because we're dealing with humans, right? We're dealing with change. This is the pandemic and it's change everywhere and for everybody. So um, there would be the ups and downs in, in, in the data and, and the performance. So what, what import, the important thing to do is to be able to detect that number one and to know what to do after. And if we are truly sustained, there would be um, support structures in the medical centers and in our system to be able to respond to that, to bring in the right people to the table and have a conversation. What have you found out? What did you do? Did you do a drill down, which everybody does? And what is it that you've done? And maybe it is just like, you know, we have new people and we have not trained them well enough, or there is a new test, or, or um, perhaps we're getting a different kind of patients. But but the important thing is, is knowing that um, uh, what could be the factors that led to the degradation. So in our organization, I mean, we just like everyone else, you know, we watch data from the regional level and the local folks are doing the same thing. And, um, and when we have met, uh, met our trigger, then we would do an outreach or we would reach out to the leaders and ask them what's going on. It's very rare that um, we would start over and um, which we've done, by the way, with CDEF because it had become um, very um, uh, critical. But um, for the most part, it's just conversation. This is what we found. We just need to do a reset and you know, have, have a training and education usually, which is a, a very easy intervention or um, not, there's nothing to, to be found and, and that is fine too. And we'll watch um, next month again. So, so for me, um, the most important piece is having a detection system and having the support structure to, to respond to what you're detecting and um, to in, uh, including 
those people who are doing the work when you're doing the responding. Thank you so much. And, and I think that, you know, this sort of rolls into to the next couple of questions that we talked about, and I'll, I'll open it to um, I, all three of you to answer is, um, you know, Christy, I think you really just described what that evaluation looks like um, and, and going back to that definition of sustainability, um, but also looking at the accountability and what role do leaders have in sustaining initiatives on the front line. And in addition to that, Christine, you also mentioned education and what are the ways to optimize mm -hmm. education um, and, and when it's being delivered and that communication as well, you know, as far as that interrupting staff, providing multiple learning modalities. Um, so I will open that to any one of you to, to answer. We have a couple of minutes before our Q&A. Maybe I can uh, uh, take that question, Chrissy, about education and uh, communication. Um, because uh, there was a question earlier as to whether uh, which one uh, should be considered uh, in terms of sustainability. But I believe that both education and communication should always come together. I believe all of you will agree with me on that. Um, but the question is which one comes first. And uh, I believe in the case of healthcare, um, in most cases, it really requires technical skills and uh, competence. And it is important that things in healthcare need to be learned. It is not something that we can just acquire through experience. When we are dealing with lives, there is no trial and error. Everything has to be exact, precise, science, and evidence-based. And as what we have um, always talked about and uh, as what we have been advocating here in patient safety movement, there should be zero harm. And so I believe this is one industry in which we can never afford to make any mistake or defect, like just like in manufacturing or in other industries. And since we are all um, living organism and viruses and bacteria are very much alive too, such as what we are going through right now in this COVID-19 pandemic, I believe we need to keep learning and studying in order for us to be able to adapt and prevent any harm from happening. And now we also hear many of our healthcare professionals being overburdened, they're tired, they're burned out. And so nobody can really complain that they are not doing their best. But the question is, it is, in, is it enough that we are doing our best? I, I really remember um, uh, this quality guru, uh, Edwards Deming saying that it is not enough that we do our best. First, you must learn and know the right thing to do, and then we do our best. And so once we have educated, or we have been educated on what is the right thing to do, and then we start communicating, echoing the right thing to be done, and then work at it towards um, uh, achieving whatever goal or plans that we have. So I think education should come first, knowing the right thing to do, and then we communicate to our um, uh, um, uh, team members or within our network and the community. Thank you so much. It, it really is, is it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> as far as that education and communication, I know Kristen, you were gonna talk a little bit further about evaluation, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I love that, um, what did you say, Joyce? There's no trial and error when it comes to patient lives. <laughs> a good takeaway. Um, I wanted to add a little bit to what Christine said, which I think was, was so spot on about the evaluation and not panicking and, and how much we love data. I think um, where I see people fail, two things. One, we don't look at anything. And then we come back a year later and say, why aren't you doing this thing that I thought you were still doing? Um, or we look at the wrong data. So just want to um, talk about the evaluation and thinking about this mixed methods, really robust um, evaluation, because when people, I think what people tend to do is focus on that main patient outcome. So there's all these things that you put in place, and then we're looking at mortality or infection rates. And that's so far removed from the actual intervention that people are missing everything that's happening in between. So we like to look at preference and performance, um, look at clinical outcomes, but also structure and process outcomes. So 
you know, can you do a quick survey or an interview of the people that are involved in the intervention and say, how is this going for you? You know, we started this thing six months ago. Is it still what you wanted? Can we, you know, think about this iterative design? Can we make any improvements for you? Um, what are all the other data points that you want to capture? Is it adoption or usage of something? Um, if you had, you know, I do a lot of clinical decision support tools, you rolled something out, are people following the recommendations that were given? So not just using it, but using it in the way that you expected them to. Are there cost issues? You know, should you be talking to IT to see if there's an economic burden or if this thing that you built, you didn't realize now requires lots of maintenance and then that might impact the sustainability. So I would say as much as you can throw a lot of evaluation components around something, um, qualitative pieces, quantitative pieces, process structure, you know, everything to really understand if something is slipping, um, but then even, you know, on the positive sides, you've sustained something for so long, why? What is it that people like about it? Um, and then you can use that, I think, to inform other initiatives as well. But to not focus on just that one, you know, infection rate or whatever that final endpoint is, even if that's the goal of what you're doing, but what's happening, you know, along that process. Kristen, thank you so much. Um, and to all of our panelists, uh, thank you. I mean, we really just demonstrated that <laughs> healthcare is complex. And when it goes into quality improvement and performance improvement initiatives, it gets even more complex. Um, and really having the appropriate stakeholders, the appropriate evaluations, this appropriate support um, in place to sustain is really critical. Um, and even, you know, jumping on to some of those other initiatives um, that we may have going on in our healthcare organizations. Um, we do have a few questions that came in through our Q&A box. Um, so the first one um, we have is how relevant is assessing organizational readiness for change. Yeah, I can start with that, um, Chrissy, because that is exactly the first step that we've done when we started working on our sustainability um, in our organization. And we found that we didn't know um, how to tell if the organization or the facility in our case is ready to take on the improvement that had been put in place as part of their standard work. So we looked far and wide to see if there was any tool out there or any framework that we could use to help us understand whether or not the facilities and the leaders and the people in it are ready to take on this project, right? That is no longer a project because it's done, we've implemented it, we're now having success, now it's all yours to, to maintain. And it turns out, um, and we, we've known this, that that's not enough. So we have developed a, a tool that we have based actually um, uh, from uh, the frameworks that IHI had developed on sustaining improvement and put together a facility and leadership readiness assessment tool. And in it, we've added we've included probes and elements that we expect based on evidence and literature, what a successful leadership um, should look like. You mentioned what is the role of leadership and sustainability? Well, a lot. That is, that, they have a lot and very important role in sustainability. Um, and what should be present, you know, in the units? What, what, what is the, the role of the nurses, the physicians? Um, the, the frontline managers, the directors, we've, we've included all of that in this tool and we have sent it out to specific leadership in our facilities and asked them, you know, granted it was self-reporting, self-reporting um, and assessing themselves on these elements and giving us a, a demonstration. So, so yes, you, you have to develop some sort of assessment uh, methodology to assess the readiness of the medical centers or the facilities or what have you. Otherwise, you know, what would usually happen is that the improvement that you have built up and, and worked so hard for um, would just go to waste, which is the theme of, of this webinar. So it's important to understand where they're at and what kind of support they need. And it's important to have something above them to be able to, to support and, and detect when they need that help. So yes. Um, Readiness, 
tool is very important. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, yeah, you have to see where your culture is at and where everyone is in order to really start implementing and, and moving things forward. Um, as I ask the next question, I do encourage our attendees to um, put any other questions they might have into the Q&A box. But the next question I have um, is change episodic or continuous or vis-a-vis -vis sustaining change? Kristen or Joyce? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on on the initiative, right? Like, there, there's always change and some that we expect and some that we don't, like a new pandemic that happens. Um, I mean, I think it sort of goes back to the original idea of sustainability and, um, you know, is this something, is this, is this a moment in time sort of change or is this something you know that that you're going to change for forever? Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but all of these considerations are really important. And so, uh, again, when you're thinking about the design of something, you know, to really think, is this something I'm going to be continuous improvement? I'm going to check on this, you know, new intervention every month for the next few years, or is this something where we need to really focus for sort of three months and then we can move on to the next thing? Um, so folks are so excited about deploying this new thing or making change and not really thinking about uh, some of these more foundational theoretical kind of concepts. Christy, can I just add something to that? That is my favorite question. To me, sustainability, change is always present. Um, and sustainability doesn't mean no change. It's not static. Sustainability to me is not an outcome. It, it is a constant process that starts from the very beginning and there's no end to it. As Joy said, you're dealing with people, right? They always present change to you. Ch things are changing right now. So change may be episodic in terms of how you respond to it, but there's always change constantly happening. So what's important is to create a culture that um, is, able to continually improve, adapt, and learn, as Joy said about the learning. So sustainability means, you know, you're, you're able to detect the changes and you know what to do with it and knowing that that's always going to be present and nothing is static. So being flexible, not being perfect, but being flexible and being able to, to learn so that you can adapt. So that to me is what sustainment is. Change is always going to be there. Yes, and I think you know, this, this question has come through very loud and clear as mm -hmm. far as um, how can leaders su support that sustainment. So for some of our leaders that are removed, you know, from units or clinical areas, um, what can they do to ensure that those efforts and sustainment is, is happening? Joyce, would you like to take that question? Yeah, um, um, uh, Chrissy, um, uh, I think there, there's one word that really, um, uh, I think, hit me and reminded me in all this uh, um, discussions today. And um, in order for um, uh, us to sustain any um, project or program, I believe being able to adapt. Adaptability is very important and tenacity at the same time. And in all of this, leadership... Uh, takes on the biggest chunk of the job, I would say, um, because it is the leaders that will set the tone. They will say the what are the correct things to do, the right things to do. But at the same time, they need managers. Uh, we all know yep. that leaders and managers are, are not identical, but they have to come to together in order for us to, for, for our, in order for our team to have a high performance. Um, leaders will say the correct things to do, but the managers will be the ones who will um, uh, help us in um, uh, leading the path and uh, in making the operational plans and the strategic plans. So um, I think um, this is really the time when, uh, especially during this pandemic, that leaders should come down from their boardroom but really come down and meet the people and talk to people and uh, make sure that everything is in order. You know, um, this is the time that leaders will need to develop that trust 
and um, transparency also um, for, for, for the people to um, understand what's going on uh, and what's happening. So I think um, at this time, um, during the pandemic, it's difficult to think about sustainability. Right now, it's really survival, I would say, for many of the organizations. But then after survival, we must learn to cope and we must make sure that we will be able, will be able to stand all these um, challenges in the future. Um, for us now, um, there's a problem in sustainability. Why is that so? Because um, a lot of our health workers are migrating and leaving the country. So really, that's a big problem for us on sustainability if we have a lack of uh, human resources to really sustain and uh, keep the operations together. Um, uh, so um, right now, um, what we're really doing is to make sure that there's um, constant education and, and training because we don't know when um, these health workers will leave us. It can be next month, it can be next week. So it really has to keep going, training, really empowering them, equipping them, and for the leaders to be really on the ground to see what's happening. Thank you so much, Joy. So we have just one final comment before we have to wrap up today. And I just wanna thank everyone. And that was uh, from one of our attendees. Someone famously said that with reference to performance improvement, that change is the only constant. And, and that really is true. Um, so thank you again to everyone in our attendees for being here today. And I will turn over uh, the closure of the webinar to Donna. Thank you all so much. What a fabulous, fabulous discussion. Um, you know, somebody commented that this was a very inspirational talk and it absolutely was, um, you know, especially these days, uh, as Joyce mentioned, just mentioned, uh, you know, in these days of the pandemic. I do just want to, um, to reinforce again for anybody who might have joined late that we are providing continuing education credit for anybody who joined the live webinar. So uh, nurses, physicians, and pharmacists will get an email from MedStar Health if you registered that way. If you um, are looking for ACHE credit, you can just log that right into your, uh, your account on the ACHE website. For certified professionals and patient safety, and for board certified patient advocates, if you registered indicating that you are looking for that kind of credit, we will be sending you a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So thank you um, everybody for joining. I, I, you know, every, every month we provide these webinars free of charge and um, we'd love for you to support us in that endeavor and be able to continue to, to offer these for free. So if you're interested in supporting us, please do visit our website um, at, uh, at patient.sm slash webinar dash donations. We will be sharing this presentation with you and, and all of the resources that everybody spoke about today. So you can always uh, find the link directly here afterwards. So um, again, uh, thank you to our panelists, to um, uh, Chrissy for doing a fabulous moderating session today and to everybody out there who joined us. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend, everybody.